I sure would. I'm Dr. Jody Long, the Department of Social Work. And last year, I'll keep this very brief, we had um, an honor society for students who achieved at a high academic level. And out came walking Madeline Stott. And I, and I, I caught Madeline and said, would you like to explore a research topic? And she agreed. <laughs> then I said, you pick a topic, and I agree. And my role was just simply saying, you're doing good. You're doing good. I just offered support. And uh, what we're going to hear today will also be good. So, Madeline? Thank you so much, Dr. Long. Like you said, my name is Madeline Stott. Um, today we're going to be looking at the need and the case for American prison reform. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Starting with a little bit of context here, just throwing some statistics at you guys. Um, in the United States, as of 2022, 639 for every 100,000 people within the United States is currently incarcerated. Over 53% of those incarcerations are perpetrators of nonviolent criminal offenses, and the majority of these are drug-related offenses such as possession and paraphernalia. Um, the U.S. incarceration rate rates roughly five times higher than any other documented nation globally, and so that's kind of um, this big implication for what's going on in America, a little worrisome. And a reason for this may be that 70% of all convictions within the United States result in incarceration. And this is something that we're not necessarily seeing in other countries, and we'll touch on that a little bit later in just one second. So who are the victims of these predatory prison practices? So black Americans are incarcerated at a rate of five times higher than white Americans, and for Latinx Americans, that rate is 1.3 times higher. And so within the United States, we have a black to white disparity um, in seven states of higher than nine to one. Um, and this is being done despite the fact that black Americans are making up only 13% of the nationwide population. They're making up 40% of the prison population. So we're seeing this clear racial disparity of who is being affected by these prison practices. And again, this is a very nuanced area. Um, there are several reasons contributing to this. But um, prison practices are definitely one reason to keep in mind for why these racial minorities are being targeted and how that's affecting their communities. So the United States is currently operating on this idea of punishment versus rehabilitation as far as prison and incarceration. And this is um, contributing to high recidivism rates and destruction within these marginalized communities. And so we see Norway as this kind of case study globally for um, rehabilita <coughs> excuse me, rehabilitation and prison practices and kind of this most humane pinnacle of how we should be if, um, approaching corrections. And so they place an emphasis on effective rehabilitation and recidivism reduction, and they do this through this um, theme of restorative justice. And so what that means is just um, rehabilitation with the perpetrator through reconciliation with the victim and the community. So they're forcing these efforts and driving them down more towards um, community efforts and rehabilitation rather than the American stance of punishment, serve your time, learn your lesson, and then get out. And so they're able to do this and keep the recidivism rates at below 20%. And again, this is kind of this case study of best case scenario. And um, so 20% recidiv recidivism rate is a very, very low percentage. But compared to the United States, our recidivism rate is currently being reported at around 76.6%. So that's quite the disparity there. So despite these massive numbers for drug incarceration in the United States, going back to that first statistic, that 53% of all incarcerations are nonviolent offenses, the majority of which being these drug offenses, there is currently no standardized program within the United States for drug rehabilitations as far as corrections go. Looking at some of the policy that we have currently within the United States, um, there's not a lot. But with um, our private prison system, because we operate on a public and private prison system, some countries do that, some countries do not. But something unique about ours is that ours have quotas. And those quotas, a lot of the time, will look like 90% of beds being filled. And that is, um, you know, as a private prison is a business, you see that monetary incentive there to keep people within the jails. And that's problematic for several reasons. There's currently no federal policy protecting vulnerable communities, going back to our, fo our focal population of mainly um, racial minorities, so black Americans, Latinx Americans, um, people within poverty. There's no federal policy protecting these communities from private prison practices and predatory public prison practices. And then going back to um, our focal population, people with felony charges are no longer allowed to vote or hold public office, and this has major implications for who is being targeted. 
for communities that are predominantly black, if um, these black populations are being incarcerated, getting felony charges for these nonviolent offenses, and are unable to vote in the public office, that is definitely going to skew the politics within that area since they're not able to participate in that democracy to the same extent as their white counterparts or their more affluent counterparts. And so in Alabama specifically, the passing of state codes HB4, HB5, and HB6, um, this is all within the last year by the way, they allocate funds to the construction of new and larger prisons and detention facilities. And so something unique about the passing of these codes and the allocation of these funds is that these funds were actually coming from COVID relief grants. And so instead of funneling this money into something that America, or I'm sorry, not America, that Alabama's um, consistently ranking lowest in, such as our, our medical facilities, our schools, our communities, um, this money is being allocated towards the creation of more private prisons and more um, corrections practices. And so we kind of see the priority here of where the state is, you know, funneling this money. And this is actually an area where um, state and federal courts have had to intervene and say, you can't allocate these funds specifically here. This is COVID relief. This needs to go to community. There was also the state code 15-22-26.2. Um, and this mandates supervised probation for all nonviolent offenders. And so this is definitely sure to contribute to those higher recidivism rates. As people um, who are not offenders of these violent crimes where they need the supervision, they're still getting that um, very close supervision. And with a lens on them, we've seen higher recidivism rates. And this is not, this is not a practice that is necessarily being um, uniform across the whole country, but this is something Alabama specific, and this is also not something we're seeing in other countries. So this is a predatory practice for sure. So there are a couple of implications that we can pull from this review of the literature and some of those statistics. And those are that racial minorities are statistically proven to be imprisoned at higher rates than white counterparts. And this is very nuanced and has a lot of different aspects that go into it, but we're seeing that the statistics are showing that um, these prison practices are contributing to that. The lack of rehabilitation practices places America as one of the highest ranking or the highest ranking, depending on your source, um, for countries regarding incapitation per capita recidivism and incarceration of drug crimes. Incarceration for drug crimes is a huge area where the United States is consistently ranking top five, number one, depending on your source. And we're targeting these minorities and marginalized groups, and this is exacerbating poverty and other problematic practices within those vulnerable communities. And again, there are several issues for why this, why this might be happening. Poverty is very complex and has lots of historical implication with it as well, but prison practices are definitely contributing to this. And then we also are seeing that our private prison system, which our businesses operating for profit, are practicing these predatory um, and very problematic actions among these communities. So looking at the role of social workers as um, I am studying for to be a social worker, some of the ways that social workers can kind of intervene um, on several levels are advocacy for local, state, and federal policy reform, and this will kind of lead into um, legislative social work and the role of social workers within policy and community. And so this doesn't necessarily have to happen on this giant federal scale as that is very intimidating and very difficult to do, but advocating and rallying, um, perhaps protesting for some of the codes that have been passed, like the ones that have been passed with the COVID grants where they're using that money for um, prisons. And then also just being active in the community and practicing policy and creating policy alongside lawmakers since social workers are so literate in um, communities and what communities need in order to prevent crime before it begins. And then back on prevention, emphasis for prevention beginning in schools or beginning in youth, and this doesn't necessarily have to look like prevention in schools, but it can. And so that would include educational programs, um, resource allocation, community outreach, and again, that education. But this can also look like early childhood development, working with parents as their children are young, and preventing that crime before it begins, and making those pris prisons that Alabama is now creating obsolete. Um, drug and substance rehabilitation programs targeted at prior offenders is a large area that could use some attention directed at it. Like I said, there's no standardized federal program for this like other countries have. And then the abolition of private prison quotas and family preservation. And family preservation doesn't necessarily have to look like DHR or CPS or DCF. This can also look like going back to prevention beginning in youth um, with that community outreach, parenting classes, things of that sort. So 
That is all I have for you guys. I would like to thank Dr. Long for working alongside me with this and giving me the opportunity and seeing so much potential in me. Um, the Department of Social Work for giving me so many opportunities. And thank you guys for coming in watching. Do we have any questions? Was there anything in, in, in your research that you saw any sort of hope for? Like yes, you know, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, so it, it does sound definitely very depressing, especially comparing America to other countries. Um, you know, we tout ourselves on being so developed and so wealthy, and um, there are a lot of areas in which we're lacking. But one thing that was hopeful is seeing all of the other people who are researching this alongside with me. And not just social workers, but other helping professions and people within the community. And as we're going forward, and especially after the COVID-19 pandemic, we're seeing a higher focus on um, restoring the justice system. And so not necessarily hope in that we've made tons and tons of progress, because evidently that is not the case, but hope in the sense that people are recognizing this is an issue and they're recognizing which populations are affected and the disparities and what needs to be done. And so um, through researching this and talking to some other people and some of the people within my department, the hope was being found in seeing that I was not the only one interested in this topic and that other people are also looking at how to remedy some of these issues. I feel bad because she asked to bring us up and I'm going to bring you back down, so I apologize for that. Um, I guess from, from my vantage point, from like a statistical machine learning aspect, I know that um, crime has always been sought after to become automated in some sense, and I know machine learning is becoming bigger in that. Is that kind of like a worry too, is that there's going to be these black box systems that will be installed as another hurdle for y'all to mm -hmm. possibly? I am not really sure about that. That's an area that I haven't really um, looked into a lot, and that's not something that really came up as I was doing my research. Oh, yeah. So I'm so sorry, but I, I'm really not sure, but that is something interesting definitely to look into in the future. Sure, yeah. You I, know, I recognizing hurdles and barriers is a big part of yeah. making progress and social change. Yeah. That would be something interesting. If to they like into. hide it behind these black boxes, is that something that's, uh, you know, something yeah. also to worry about? <laughs> uh -huh. Oh yeah, there's plenty to worry about. But that's actually something really interesting that would be interesting to look into. I'm sorry, I don't have a better oh, answer. You're fine, you're fine. <laughs> yes. How much did your research go into um, maybe like factual court systems Yeah, so this research specifically was a little bit broader, and I'm going to be doing another presentation in a uh, couple of weeks at JSU Social Work Day with Dr. Long, and that one will go into a little bit more in depth. But for this presentation specifically, we're looking mostly at racial disparities and what is being um, practiced, but um, policy practices and court and everything like that does play a large role into that. So there's a little bit of touching on that, but the majority of the research, um, as far as this purpose, was looking more at what is happening on this bigger scope, and then that will be funneled down um, as further research is done, but you are absolutely correct that um, longer sentencing and court practices do play a very large role in um, the United States prison system. So, yes and no. <laughs> yes. How could they justify using COVID-19 money for prisons? Uh, <laughs> that's uh, a lot of a lot of political rhetoric and hoping nobody would notice. I guess. Um, they didn't get very far, but um, crazy justifications. I mean, people can justify anything, and especially in a country like Alabama with our political climate, it's very easy to justify um, the safety of our communities and kind of overlooking the nuance of what safety actually is and how prisons play a role in safety. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you guys so much.